Very well exhibited here. Uh -huh. Don't say that. I don't want to hear that. <laughs> I'm going to introduce you, and then you can start. Okay, you want me to stay here? Yes. Okay. Let me grab my papers here. Hello. Hello. Well, when I say welcome everyone. Uh, we're about to start the public debates on cities. So this debate, it's part of our educational program. It's uh, designed and organized by the Education and Research Units at the Norman Foster Foundation. So let me introduce you to Professor Kent Larson. He's director of the MIT City Science Initiative Group uh, in Massachusetts, USA. So please join me in welcoming Professor Larson. Thank you, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I, I just, first of all, want to thank the Norman Foster Foundation and uh, Bloomberg Philanthropies for being so generous and hosting this event and uh, make, making possible the Norman Foster Workshop on Cities. So we are uh, going to divide the night up into two segments. The first is we'll talk about governance and the second part, we will talk uh, about transformation. Now, this is a little bit unusual for perhaps many of you in that we're doing this Pecha Kucha style. Does, how many people know Pecha Kucha? Okay, the young people know Pecha Kucha. <laughs> All right, the format is 20 slides, 20 seconds, exactly six minutes, 40 seconds each presentation. Although we'll be a little loose. We have a, we have a, a sort of a rule at MIT, when we set rules, the first rule is that you can break the rules if you need to. So uh, yeah, we'll see how that goes. I, I'm going to start out um, the governance portion with a, uh, with, with a, my form of a Petri Kucha presentation. So the big issue that we're asking is how can we enable more livable, entrepreneurial, high-performance communities? What do we mean by that? So livable, of course, quality of life. This is, what the, this is what I hear from the mayors. This is what the mayors want. Entrepreneurial is about jobs, increase in GDP, et cetera. High performance is how efficiently we produce and consume energy and water and land and food. And I would add to that time. Uh, mayors don't tend to care about smart cities. They care about these higher level qualities. What we have realized is we have to move towards a more scalable process if we're going to have impact, particularly in the developing world where they don't have the resources to do it the way we do it in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, so more broadly, in terms of the process, we begin by thinking about insight. Uh, insight, in our definition, it would be data analysis to actually uh, understand current conditions. It's pretty simple, you want to know how things are today. Transformation then. What are the series of transformations that we could apply that could improve on all those conditions? This could be urban design, mobility, energy innovation, food innovation, et cetera. But even if you have developed these transformations informed by the insight process, uh, we need to predict their impact. So this would be modeling and simulation to predict the impact of all of these interventions, and then finally... I spend more than 60% of my income on rent. I finished school, I'm a college so that graduate, gives you a good I did sense. everything I didn't the right for the sound way. So where am I supposed to So that gives you a good sense of the kind of, the, 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 the kind of chaos that you can get into in, the, in an approval process, and we're trying to find ways of rationalizing that process. You could turn the sound all the way off. So, um, Tonight we'll talk about governance, strategies, policies to help create and maintain healthy, high-functioning communities, and transformation interventions to improve those conditions, like I said. So uh, Estonia is a leader in uh, governance, e-governance, and these are all the different uh, projects that they have developed uh, starting in 1997. 
Uh, it's all pretty interesting, but that's not actually why, what I want to focus on. I, I, want, I want to ask the question, how can we enable a more evidence-based community decision-making process? Two, how can we encourage pro-social development, efficient use of resources, and how can we promote pro-social behaviors of a resident? Uh, a project that we did was in um, Boston where they were putting in a new rapid bus rapid transit system, a BRT, similar to what was in Bogota. Now, if you look at this, uh, you're, you're taking away car lanes, so the car-oriented people hate this solution. Uh, but you're expediting the movement of mass transit, so the mass transit people like it, and by the way, the bus people love it as well. The process, when you have this kind of emotionally charged issue, tends to be very controversial. So what we did, we built three platforms, community, uh, regional scale, community scale, street scale, and then engaged with the community where all of these lines were crossing to uh, help facilitate a consensus building process. So we started at the regional scale. This was a touch screen where you could identify where you lived, where you worked, what, how your commute time would change, how many more resources were available in a given commute. This actually didn't work very well. well. It was too complicated. It wasn't really appropriate for the community. Then we built a neighborhood scale model. This worked much better. We used little optically tagged Lego bricks where people could move the stations around and immediately see the impact on commute times, et cetera, and how it might affect the streetscape. We also then built a streetscape model where one could interactively move the station locations, replace parallel parking with bike lanes. And we used, we used these toys because there, were no, there was no barrier to participation. Everybody knew they could, they could uh, just experiment. And as they did that, this kind of data was fed back to people, and then we could, we could collect their preferences. Uh, <clears throat> we're also interested in replacing static land use regulations with something more dynamic, algorithmic zoning for pro-social development. So it's very common to offer a developer an FAR incentive, build a larger building in exchange for things that can be a benefit to the community. And the process here is the community defines what they care about in a fine-grained way, way and prioritize them. An algorithm then matches that to bonuses that are dynamically adjusted. The property developer can pick the bonuses they want and immediately that's mapped to benefits and, and in this way we might be able to incentivize housing for people that usually aren't addressed by market housing, young professionals, families, workforce, incentivize grocery stores and pharmacies and things that typically aren't in a high value part of the city. Uh, it can allow developers to contribute to infrastructure and all of the property owners in the district to share equally. Uh, another project that we're very interested in is the flip side of that, which are local economies to uh, incentivize pro-social behaviors. So right now we have a centralized economy, properties owned by very few, and they are the main beneficiaries of the improvement of the economy. So we're looking at now a dis distributed token economy enabled by blockchain where the residents are both consumers and investors with equity in a community, and you have rules and exchange rates to optimize for things like social, cultural, environmental benefits. So how might that work? So in a district, you have a geofenced area, you use your phone to make a purchase, and those tokens, when you make that pur purchase electronically, uh, might be of higher value if you shop locally, if you live and work in the district of higher value, if uh, you are a of a demographic profile that's desirable, like young professionals needed by the tech industry, if you volunteer more or you if you live a long time in the district, they might be worth more. And it could en enable peer-to-peer -peer sort of barter systems using pre-tax dollars. And in all of this, the city scope that we're building, this uh, decision support platform communities could be the oracle that could establish those relationships and be used for the community to establish their values. Thank you. Okay, second Pecha Kucha, Beatrice Scolomina. Uh, she is the founding director of the interdisciplinary program 
in Media and Modernity at Princeton University, Professor of History and Theory at the School of Architecture, and she's on the advisory board of the Norman Foster Foundation. Beatrice. Thank you very much. All right, so there's no time, so very quickly. I love Madrid, by the way, and I love the Norman Foster Foundation. I'm very happy to be here. So the city of social media is all about the question of the internet and social media uh, that, in my view, are fundamentally uh, redefining the spaces in which we live, our relationship to objects and to each other. In other words, social media is a new form of urbanization, the architecture of how we live together. How did I get to uh, this uh, uh, theme? It's uh, quite by chance. I read uh, uh, in what is probably now a totally conservative estimate in the Wall Street Journal in the year uh, 2012 that 80%, 80% of young uh, New York City professionals uh, are working regularly from bed. So millions of uh, dispersed beds are already uh, taking over from concentrated office uh, buildings. The boudoir is defeating the tower. Network electronic technologies have removed any limit to what can be done in bed. Now, how did we get uh, here? Since I'm a historian, I cannot uh, stop myself from asking that question. And I went back to this uh, beautiful test of uh, Walter Benjamin, where he writes that under Louis Philippe, the private citizen enters the stage of history. For the private person, living in space becomes for the first time antithetical to the place of work. The former is constituted by the interior, the office is its complement. So, of course, Walter Benjamin is talking about how industrialization uh, um, separated or split the place of work and the, place, uh, and the home in the 19th century. Industrialization, of course, brought with it this eight-hour uh, shift, uh, war shift, and the radical separation between place of uh, um, war, like the office or the factory, and the home, between uh, uh, the home and the office. Post-industrialization, on the other hand, collapses work back into the home and takes it further into the bedroom uh, itself and into the bed itself. The whole universe is now concentrated in this small screen with a bed floating in this infinite sea of information. To lie down now is uh, not to rest but to move. The bed is now a site of action. But of course, this voluntary invalid has no need for her legs, as you can see in this picture. The bed has become the ultimate prosthetic uh, 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 and a whole new industry is de devoted to providing contraption to facilitate work while lying down, reading, writing, testing, recording, broadcasting, listening, talking, and of course, eating, drinking, sleeping, or making uh, love. This philosophy, in a way, was already embodied in the figure of Hugh Hefner, who famously almost never left his bed, let alone his house. He literally moved his office into his bed in 1960 when he moved into the Playboy Mansion in Chicago, turning into the epicenter of a global empire and his silk pajamas and dressing gown into a new kind of business attire. I don't go out of the house at all. I am a contemporary recluse, he told Tom Wolf, who had come to interview him. And of course, the interview takes place in bed. And then he guesses that the last time he had been, Hefner had been out of the house, had have been three and a half months before, and that in the last two years he had been out of the house only nine times. Fascinated Wolf uh, described him as the tender, timpani, green heart of an artichoke. Playboy uh, turned uh, uh, the bed into a workplace. From the mid 50s on, the bed becomes increasingly sophisticated, outfitted with all kinds of sorts of entertainment and communication devices as a kind of control room. But Hefner was actually not alone. In an interview in Paris Review in 1957, Truman Capote is asked, what are some of your writing uh, habits? To which he answers, I'm a completely horizontal author. I cannot even think unless I am lying down, either in bed or stretching a cross with a cigarette and a coffee uh, handy. Even architects, surprisingly enough, set up office in bed at mid-century. Richard Neutra started working the moment he woke up with elaborate equipment, enabled him to write, design, or even interview in bed. His one concession to convention was to put a tie over his pyjamas when receiving visitors still prop up in bed. The kind of uh, equipment that Hefner envisioned, uh, I don't know why he jumps, uh, 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 is now expanded, of course, to the internet and social media generation who not only work in bed, but socialize in bed, exercise in bed, read the news in bed, and entertain sexual relationships with people miles away from their bed. 
if according uh, to Jonathan Crary, late capitalism is the end of sleep, colonizing every minute of our lives for production and consumption, then the actions of this voluntary recluse are not so voluntary in the end. But in fact, the arguments of Crary may be obsolete as well, because the 19th century uh, division of the city between rest and work may have become also already obsolete. Not only have our habits and our habitat changed with the internet and social media, but predictions about the end of human labor in the wake of new technologies and robotization are no longer treated as futuristic. 35 years ago, uh, the late economist Vasily Leontief said they replaced horses, didn't they? And the business section of the New York Times recently reconsidered this idea of the end of the human world horses. Horses hung around in the labor force for quite some time after they were first challenged by modern communication technologies like the telegraph and the railroad, hauling stuff and people around farms and cities. But when the internal combustion engine came along, horses as a critical component of the world economy were history. Humans as a war horse, as war horses might also be on the way out. Now, economists wonder what type of economic model this uh, reality will lead to, from growing inequalities with vast amount of people unemployed to large redistributions uh, in the form of the universal basic income, which has re was recently considered, as you know, in a referendum in Switzerland and rejected. But the fact that it was considered is what we should be thinking about. The end of pay labor and its replacement. This is the interesting thing that as architects we were thinking about it way before. The end uh, of why is it not working now? Ah, the end of pay labor and its replacement uh, with creative leisure was, uh, of course, already envisioned in utopian projects of the 60s and 70s uh, by people like Constant, Super Studio, Archigram, uh, Archizum, etc., including always this hyper equipped uh, bed. Student architects now return uh, to this question now that this is uh, urgent. Meanwhile, uh, the city has started to redesign itself largely without us uh, architects. Today, many companies are providing these sleeping pods in the office to maximize productivity. productivity. Bed and office are never far apart in the 24-7 world. A special self-enclosed uh, beds, uh, as these ones, the metro naps have been designed, which are like compact, sealed uh, capsules, mini spaces that can be used in isolation or gathered together in clusters for synchronized sleep that is understood, of course, as part of work rather than its opposite. As Ariana Huffington predicts, recharging rooms will be as common as board rooms. But these relaxation spaces and technologies are not simply appearing in, uh, inside offices. Whole new building types are emerging, dedicated to sleep, and are popping up in every place, like uh, uh, every major city like New York. My point here is that the question of the bed is an urban uh, question, one of the urban questions calling for, an at for our attention uh, today. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, next up is Jose Luis uh, Vallejo, and who is a professor at Harvard's Graduate School of uh, Design since 1910 and co-founder of the Madrid and Miami-based design and consulting firm Ecosistema Urbano. Okay, um, hopefully you're already out of bed and awake. Uh, this is the second round. And I'm, I'm talking, I'm part of the management uh, panel. And uh, well, I'm gonna show you just uh, 10 learnings we, we, have, uh, from, we have learned from the city. So that's why we have titled it 10 things we have learned from the city. Okay, starting from the first one. And these are learnings we have le learned in different cities. In the, in the last 15 years, we have, we are, we have been lucky enough to, to be able to work in different parts of the world, in different cities. And we have uh, learned many things from working in, in those uh, urban environments. So the first one is this idea of urban social design. So this is something is, this, that is worth for us, but you can use it to manage a, an architectural office, but also uh, if you are clever enough, you can even manage uh, to work with it uh, to manage uh, a, a complete city. Okay, Ur uh, urban social design, three words that describe our dedication, the urban context, the social approach, and the design understood as an action, an interaction, and a tool for transformation. And I'm not gonna talk about uh, I'm, I'm just gonna 
show us super fast some images of some of the projects that are connected to those learnings. So in this case, I'm starting with a question mark. It's like why we are always, uh, as architects, uh, urban planners or urban designers, removing that part of the equation. So the part of the human, uh, the social layer, removing from the part of the city, from the part of the in infrastructures. The second one is creativity is a network. So in a globalized world, creativity is the capacity to connect things innovatively and thus we understand that the protagonist of the creative process is not just a team, but an open and multi-layer design network. In this case, we were working in, in, in Honduras, in Tegucigalpa, and we were facing uh, uh, the, the lack of public space due to the violence in the public space. So public spaces were completely abandoned by this uh, omnipresence of uh, violence. Uh, uh, the third one is community first, where um, cities are created and maintained by people for people and urban development only makes sense when the community cares about it. We work to empower the communities to drive the projects that affect them, so social relevance is guaranteed. In this case we were working in Asuncion in Paraguay and we, we were facing the dichotomy between and all the learning that we can extract from the, this dichotomy between uh, formality and informality. The fourth one is going local, uh, just as cities have residents and visitors and planning is made at different scales, every urban project is born in a constant movement between the direct experience and specificity of the local context and the global shared flow of information and knowledge. This is just an example of an app we have developed, it's called What If Cities and we have implemented this app to georeference the opinions, the concerns of the people in different parts of the city. It has no scale, it can be used in a public space, it can be used completely in a whole city. So we have been working with this app, with this idea of uh, uh, that we need to ask people because they are also part of the equation where we are transforming urban spaces. Next uh, learning from the city is a uh, very important one, when you manage uh, to work with public participation processes, it's accepting and manag managing conflict. So participation is like a conversation and it means letting all the points of view be raised and listen to public debate because public debate only makes sense if all the stakeholders are involved. Every project affecting the city has to deal with both opposition and support, consensus and contradiction. In this case, we were working in Hamar in the north of Oslo, in Norway, and we were in, in such an intense uh, public participation process that it, it, it was even against us. But for us, that part of confronting also conflict was part of, of a healthy situation because people really care about what, what that transformation that was, was going to happen in, in their own uh, city. Uh, sixth uh, learning is assuming complexity. And encompassing the complexity of the urban environment requires simplifying it. Instead, we prefer to admit its vast character and understand how work as a thin layer with limited and at times unpredictable effects carefully inserted into that complexity. In this case, again, in the uh, historical part of uh, uh, Tegucigalpa in Honduras, we, we managed to create a tissue of concept to help the people to fight violence in their public space in order to reconquer the public spaces of the city. Seven is learning by doing, and that's also, again, super important. Uh, our experiences grow through practice. We know what we can do, and we challenge ourselves to do what we think we should be doing. We solve the unexpected issues as we move, and then we take our lessons from the process and the results. In this case, we were working in Encarnacion in the south of Paraguay and we were transforming, we were rethinking uh, the city for the next 25 years and uh, it was also part of the equation uh, dealing with uh, mobility and in this case it was very important to test directly in the ground with a group of very active and, and proactive uh, uh, students of architecture, the new generation of, of, uh, of architects, the new generation of urban uh, designers of that city uh, how what was happening if we were on the ground directly into the uh, jump into action to transform and to create a bike lanes in one night six kilometers of bike lanes connecting the city with the with the uh, uh, with university. Eight planning and being flexible. Urban development is what happens in the city while others try to plan it. We think ahead, make our dispositions, but we are always ready for reality to change our plans, mostly for the better. Rigidity kills opportunity, participation, and urban life. 
In this case, I'm talking about a project in the periphery of Madrid, the Eco Boulevard of Vallecas, that was thought as a platform for many things to happen, uh, a platform in which uh, citizens were provoked to, uh, I mean, for, for use this new space, and many things happened there beyond our own expectations. Uh, nine, embracing transdisciplinarity, and we assume that our role as professionals is evolving, disciplinary bonds, bonds are loosening, urban projects are complex and circumstances are continuously changing. This requires open-minded professionals flexible enough to adapt their roles and skills and to use unusual tools. In this case, we're working in Shanghai and we work with an amazing group of engineers developing this kind of device that was at the same time uh, uh, creating a balance of energy but also producing new climatic uh, situations in the public space, trying to bring into Shanghai the qualities of the public space of the Mediterranean city. And then, and the last one, is keeping it open. Open means transparent, accessible, inclusive, collaborative, modifiable, re reproducible. Open means more people can be part of and benefit from it. These are the attributes that define a project made for the common good. In this case, all our urban interventions have a parallel digital layer where all information shared in real time is open under Creative Commons license. Okay, thank you. I hope you enjoy these 10 <laughs> learnings we have. Thank you, uh, Luis. So next up, uh, Leonard Tarasson. So she holds a doctorate in meteorology with an emphasis on atmospheric chemistry. She is a research director at the Norwegian Institute for Air Research. Uh, Dr. Tarasson uses advanced air pollution modeling in conjunction with urban planning tools in order to improve urban air quality. Okay, thank you. Thank you to the Norman Foster Foundation for being here. It's really good to have a chance to come with such a technical background as mine into this very inspiring group. Um, the uh, question on uh, urbani urbanism now is it's becoming transdisciplinary. And one of the points also is about env environmentalism, that it's also transdisciplinary. So how clean is the air we breathe? How good do we know how we measure the air quality that we have here? How can uh, city planners, environmental uh, experts, and urbanists work together to improve, together with citizens, the air we breathe in our cities. Clean air has become a requisite for better quality of life. Now that about 50% of the uh, population globally lives in cities, we really have seen air quality standards developing all over the world. And these air quality standards, how do we know that they are all right? We have measurements, traditional measurements. Most places have these standards, and we have that type of monitoring that we've seen in many of the areas. It's large, it's complex, they are very expensive, uh, sophisticated material, um, measurements that we use for this, and they are expensive. Because they are expensive, they are then very sparse. In this city in the Philippines, we have about 10, and it's a number that is large, considering how, how much information we have. That's not big data. So how do we have any alternative to, to get to this uh, air quality monitoring and knowing more about the air quality? There is an alternative with satellite data. That's really bringing in an enormous amount of information Satellite-based air quality monitoring began 15 years ago, clearly developing in NASA and ESA. And now also the Chinese space agencies are coming in and working with this. The very good part with this information from, uh, from satellites is it covers all the globe, but it doesn't go to street level. We need an alternative that gets us in, in, in our normal life, that gets to the city level and to the street levels. So what alternative do we have there? And there might be an alternative with the use of air quality microsensors. And this is something that city planners are now learning very much, and it's coming out as an important alternative that makes also what we call participatory services, where we can come in with devices that don't look larger than this small thing that I have here, <laughs> that you can have it on yourself, and then try to look at uh, the different information uh, in the city. 
When we're looking at uh, the city of Oslo, we have 10 stations. If we have this type of uh, sensors, we can get up to about 50, which is an interesting information. We can get only, we can get more information in the city, but we can get it also in the sources. We know traffic is an important uh, area of pollution. We can go to them and follow the buses, follow the pollutants, and see what happens in, hot, in hotspots. It's not only the hotspots, but it's also where people are. When you are biking, when you are choosing your way to, to work, what is the better air that you are having in? We're putting it in the bicycles and then helping with this mobility to know people, to, to get people some, ch some choices. Also when they walk, what streets are the better ones, which parks are the ones that I want to run. These are important information that can be brought about with new technology. That new technology brings opportunities. It supplements what we have already on the traditional networks. It monitors at the sources and it manages to say something about our own health. So you get very personalized information. And through that, we can also do something even more important, which is to stimulate the, the, the um, citizen participation and the awareness on air quality. It also creates new challenges. And data quality is really a challenge. In the time of fake news, we really want to have quality. We need to have also an idea of how long time can we have this type of, uh, of uh, measures. And the data privacy, the communication is important. What we see now on quality is that there is a general lack of information on the performance of, of these uh, microsensors. Mostly, we know that they are perfect in their web pages, but when we go to the field calibration, we still have a challenge. And what it is promised in the web pages don't really get there when we are looking at the, at the data in the, in the streets with the actual pollution and with the actual weather that we are having in. It's uh, important to know that a good performance in laboratory is not indicative of a good performance in the field and that it is different for each single of those uh, components. So it's really quite challenging to know how to get good information out of it. And it needs what we call knowledge integration. And knowledge integration is really getting information from traditional sources, from models, from, uh, from the sensors, putting it together into understanding what is the type of information that can be provided. With this type of knowledge information then, we can do a sensor deployment in the cities that can help understanding much better how much we, are, we attain our levels of compliance with the standards that we've put in, but most importantly, what measures can be put in? How do we put ourselves as planners and as citizens to make better information in the city? The sensor choices, getting to know which ones, that's a city governance responsibility. It's the city planners that need to provide us with um, quality data that is reliable and it is timely. But air quality, that's a common responsibility and it's important for all of us to understand these choices and be engaged into choosing how the city has to change to make a better air quality for all of us. Thank you. Next, uh, we'll hear from Luis Cuerto. So, Mr. Cuerto is the general coordinator of the mayor for the mayor of Madrid. Uh, he was uh, formerly the deputy, deputy uh, general business innovation promoter for Spain's Ministry of Science and Innovation. Thank you. This is not by casualty. This seminar is in Madrid because it's Madrid is where the things happen. So. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Norman and Blurbrin, for having this interesting debate in Madrid. As a general coordinator, I'm guilty of almost everything that happens in the city. So uh, my excuse in advance of where we are going to stay now. We came to office because we are the son or the daughters of the crisis, economical crisis and moral crisis and political crisis. That's why in many cities of Spain, non-professional politicians came to office. Because normally there was the popular party, or socialist party, Partochin, 
the power. But as a miracle, a new team came. That is because people wanted to change from the classical, every four years we vote and we disappear, to make part of the city. That means, and it's a very important requisite, to join transparency, open data, to become a real citizen, to be able to participate. We are in a very, in my opinion, interesting work in progress in Madrid. Maybe we are at the 10% of the future, but you have to begin with. I think we are doing with honesty and with the political will to do that. That means to be credible, it needs to be closed, and it's, of course, you need technology and human resources. Political will, it is the axe of the approach. It's a new way of making policy. It's the new way of making city. It's no more the city of them, but it is the city of us. It's mandatory. If not, we are failing. We have not come to the city to, to do a good job. We have come to make a different job. This is very important. So the uh, objective is to work with, not to work for the citizens. This is very important. Closeness. Every citizen of Madrid can touch, can speak to Manuela or Mayor every day because she, as a, as a discourse, travels every morning and every night in the subway. So you see your neighbor and you say, I saw yesterday Manuela and I tell them how I'm worried about that. It happens every day. And she visits every district once a month to talk and to discuss and to be insulted even by the citizens that don't agree what they are, we are doing. To be close is a major issue. As we know very well, mainly in Catalonia, we can't make compulsory referendum in the city of Madrid. Only the central government can, legally. But even that, we have made publicly our compromise. We are going to do what the citizens tell us to do. Even if it's not legality, it's a kind of compromise. Participation as a formality or to do anything? We spend every year no less than 100 million to balance the city. This number of actions is to change the rich neighbors, the poor neighbors, investments, technology, services. This is what we are asked to do, not to be a good employee of the, some classes of the city. We have to work for all the city, not only for the people that voted us, is for to balance the city. For that, you need instruments. We have a very interesting platform I will show you later. And which is more important, the back office, no less than 300 civil servants making possible the ideas, the desires, the projects, the illusions of the neighbors. Because if not, you just make it formal. But you need to say no in that way, but yes in that way. Uh, civil servants are very used, are educated to say no. But if you change that mentality, you make a miracle. We're trying to, not very easy. Two ways to work. One is neighborhoods in the city hall, and the other way is city halls outside with the neighbors. The first is different instruments, local forums, participatory projects, decidemadrid.es, Media La Prado, and some kinds, I will describe only two or three, projects with neighborhoods. In 21 district of Madrid, 21 local forum. In each one, I guess we maintain the curiosity, the energy, the participation of 
150 neighbors going every, every Tuesday to the district to design, to develop, to discuss, to evaluate the policy we're making locally. It is uh, a thing of, of accountability to be very close to your local responsible, not just in the city hall that is maybe too far from San Blas or from Vallecas. You are called to be part of the policy of Vallecas or of Salamanca or whatever. Second, I think we can be called the Porto Alegre of Europe. We dedicated year, last year 60 million euros to be decided by neighbors, what do you want your money is spending in? This year, we have offered 100 million euros. That means 2% of the budget of the city hall. That is about 5 billion. You decide. One decision in your neighbor, one decision in the city hall. Once we decide, it's legal, it's our competence, it's affordable, all, and we help you to make a good proposal. We're very engaged in that policy and seeing the problems we are causing and trying to solve them. Perhaps in the debate we can talk a bit about that. Media La Prado is the better example of open institution. You are not asked who you are, but what you propose. You mix with professionals, you mix with the city hall, you mix with what it is important is the project, not the school you come of. This is a very interesting institution in the city of Madrid of co-creation of new initiatives that we support to make them real. One of this project is Experimenta District. Neighborhoods, neighbors create local labs. They decide it is a very small thing, but for our neighbor is very important to have this garden clean or to have small expenditures important for the city, important. I remember one is I don't want to consult the web page of pollution. Of, I want to have a red, green or, or red light in the school when I take my children there. Please put that light. Just I want only that. Very simple. This was an initiative of this kind of projects of experimental district. Imagina Madrid, in nine places, we are working with cultural agents to, to redesign empty spaces. The, the city is full of empty spaces that no one thought about them, but the neighbors leave them, and they want to walk to be heard, and they want to be helped by experts with how to do with that. Self-managed center. This is uh, La Plaza de la Cebada. Uh, we converted in a legal situation what was previously illegal, is you decide you are allowed to manage this space. You are helped with some resources, but you are who give the permission. In an assembly, you decide who is the owner, and this is very important. We have changed the classical private-public collaboration, but what we have called public social collaboration, which is some nuance that has in its importance. Social economy, in four district, energy, food, recycling, mobility, and what we have called the city of care is transversal. The social economy in some cities is 10% of the GDP of a city. We are trying to support uh, very strongly this kind of projects. Results. You, you don't order, you don't uh, uh, obey an instruction. Is that you decide to launch initiative. In this transparency, you see that in this platform, Civics or many others, there is a high density of social initiatives in Madrid. Or uh, maybe you know the plan of Los Madriles, which is the plan of the social initiatives in the different neighbors of Madrid. This is not top down, is bottom up. Two weeks ago, we are proud to share with you, we received the award of the United Nations of the most uh, innovative public service of the platform designmadrid.es. 
uh, even if it's very in the beginning of what it could be in the future, we are very proud to be distinguished by United Nations. Media La Prado, according to Margaret Prince's institution, was the most innovative institution in 2016. When you make qualities or surveys of services, you realize that it, it works, people is engaged, they gain confidence in their city hall. Not because we do well, because we do with them, which is a very in, in different thing. When we co-create a, a library in San Fermin, it's not the library of the city hall, it's our library. It is very different than that. Participatory budget, we received this year 300 projects, more, some interesting, other not so much. And in rankings, you can show different rankings, but Madrid is the third most um, interesting digital governance city in the world. Finally, a challenge. The participation has a very severe lack of credibility. When you make an inquiry, a pool, and you ask 1,500 people, you scientifically dare to say, Madrileños support that, Madrileños their opinion of that. But when a participation project has 10 times or 20 times more participants, they say, oh, only 1% of the census voted. So our challenge is to mix Demoscopia universe with participation universe. The random system to make pools must be mixed with the random invitation to participate. I think we can mix that to gain credibility and we are in that work of, uh, hardly because we believe in it. Thank you very much. So, Luis, maybe we can start with you. And you worked for the mayor's office, and I've, I've never met a mayor I didn't like <laughs> because they're, they're doers, they're problem solvers, they're less ideological than typically those at the federal level. And the, the center of gravity of innovation seems to be shifting from federal governments to mayors as can be seen with all the fantastic work you showed. How can we, as a society, get to cities and their mayors the resources that they need so they can, they can have um, the ability to, to take action that's in sync with their economic and cultural power? I, th I think technology can help to do two or three policies that we have tried, we are in the beginning, but they are gaining force. I will put two examples. The mayor of Paris declared no one diesel car will circulate in Paris in, 12, in 2025. Mm -hmm. The mayor of Madrid says no diesel car will circulate in Madrid in 2025. Mm -hmm. We have not said anything about the industry. We only say they will not circulate in our cities. Mm -hmm. That's what we call diplomacy of the cities. Mm -hmm. We have not made an international treaty. We have not done a enormous indemnization to the industry. We say, you, fabric you made the cars, but not in my city. This is so simple that we can do that. Second, if you buy 100 trucks to collect the garbage, you have to buy the trucks is in the market. But if you buy 400 trucks, the industry make the truck you want. The mayor of London invited us to buy jointly trucks for collecting garbage. We were not synchronized because they had the money last year and we have this year. But as soon as we can get compromises to buy together, we will be a most important agent. So we have competence. We have to do it jointly with other mayor. This is my opinion. So uh, what I hear you saying, if, if, the, if the mayors can form alliances and take action, that they can bypass the limitations that, that are otherwise imposed on them. It is happening now. Yeah. It is happening. Okay. Each time more we are able to have good information at the same time, to make policies at the same time, that will be real. 
But I think we are in a very promising beginning to do that. Okay. So, um, Leonor, uh, so you're doing this fantastic work in with monitoring, which gives us insight into how the conditions are, and you, you talked about using that to increase the awareness of the public. Um, but how can we use that to actually uh, address the problem? And, and what, are the, what are the solutions that you think can be informed by the work that you're doing? It's a very important question because it links very much to governance again mm -hmm. and to what the cities are doing. We cannot do it alone. It's the citizens, but it's very important also to have the city authorities mm -hmm. working then to put together this type of solutions and then ask for the uh, citizens to answer about them. In, in Oslo, it's been uh, a very difficult situation because the diesel cars were forbidden the first time. It was last year. It was forbidden to circulate with diesel car in a, in a short-term um, episode of air pollution. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting that then the Minister of, um, the Minister of uh, Communications in Norway said this is not good. So it was the city authorities putting this in place and our central government saying this is a problem for the diesel cars. Which makes always a, an interesting situation where it is the central government versus the city government. How do we put this together? Very different situation with electric cars. Oslo is the capital of electric cars. It's been with good incentives at national level, with good information at local level, and with the citizens then understanding that they get incentives for getting the uh, cars bought, and also the possibility of having a city planning that has put a lot of um, uh, um, opportunities for, for la uh, ladding, how, how do you say that? Uh, to put the cars into place. So what is important here is communication. It is the different types of knowledge. It's the knowledge that we have from the scientific point of view, but it's also the citizen knowledge, it is the governance knowledge, and it is the political knowledge that we need to put together, as well as the industry and the possibilities of having a technology that works. So, Jose Luis, so, so connecting to the work that they're both doing, you, you, one of your 10 points was communities first, and you talked about um, uh, more or less a bottom-up approach, which I think Luis mentioned, and that's mm -hmm. monitoring via bicycles is really that approach, but you, you, uh, you come from um, an architecture background, urban planning background, as I do, where traditionally that's been very top-down. Solutions have been imposed on communities. You know, the tradition of the urban planner and the master builder and, and people in, in governance, um, in government, imposing solutions. Uh, so how does top-down meet bottom-up in some optimal way? Or do you think it can all yeah. be bottom-up eventually? Mm -hmm. No, I, I mean, for me, that's, and that's really a learning we, we got from the city. And that's because uh, one of our first uh, projects was work, working, making a project for the public space. Mm -hmm. So when you make that, and when you do not start working in a kind of an isolated uh, object, that you are going to place it uh, as a metaphor in a, no, in a part of the city, but you work with the public realm, you realize that many of the learnings you I had at first in the school, like this idea of working with metaphoric approaches and trying to pro project my own obsessions into the city was not possible because um, uh, you cannot control the conditions as you can control it in architecture. Mm -hmm. So you have to, in a way, you have to learn how to negotiate, how to, how to uh, promote more kind of democratic uh, approaches to the design of cities. And this is something we have been learning since, since there. So, and at the same time, it was something that we learned that we, uh, we didn't, uh, we, we wanted to, let's say, open the black box of design in terms of that everything happens in, 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 the, uh, in the mayor's office and, and later when all the, maybe the main decisions are already made, which is you, you have a place and you have a program. Uh, uh, then you, the uh, architects arrive in order just, uh, let's say, like the arm of this top-down situation. So we wanted to confront that situation and we want also wanted to be part of the, that part of the process where usually architects are not, which is happening just before when the architects start working. It's like 
being part of the decision taking process, being part and being central part and be, uh, using our tools of design in order to design also the process that happens before, when, when these decisions are already taken. Is where are we gonna do this? How is gonna be done? Uh, and many other uh, very relevant uh, uh, decisions that are usually taken by a, by a very few amount of people. And on the other side, they are amazingly important and relevant for the, uh, for the citizens in general. So that's a very important learning we got from working yeah. in cities. Can I add something? If you don't uh, dedicate exhausting time of dialogue, everything is sent to the courts. And the really, the, who rules the city are the judges, not the mayors. So yeah. this is a great problem. You should yeah. avoid that. Yeah, dialogue, yeah. Beatrice. Yes. Uh, <coughs> So th there is a trend uh, of uh, young people, many of the young people in, in, this, in this room, of choosing location in a vibrant urban environment over space and isolation. Absolutely. And um, you, 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 you kind of implied, or maybe you stated, that, that the, the bed is the center of life in, for many people. <laughs> But what I guess I would like you to speculate on what you think this hyper-efficient, affordable living environment in the future will be for young people, or maybe in general for, for all yes, people. In general, I suppose it's in general. I think it, it doesn't have to be young people. It could also be old people. You know, so it, it's interesting because I think we are living so so an incredible transformation in the ways in which. We live and, and we work uh, uh, perhaps with the same uh, dimension of that that brought to us, uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, uh, what Benjamin talks about, right? The, the separation between the place of work and the place of uh, uh, living. That I'm sure it was extremely traumatic to the generation that live uh, through, through this. And now we're in the middle of, uh, uh, have been for, for a while, uh, from some decades, in the middle of a profound transformations in the ways in which we are living. And I find that uh, in many discussions uh, about the city and about architecture, this is not really uh, acknowledged. Uh, so it is interesting, uh, it was uh, really fascinating for me, this moment of realization that 80%, 80%, and this is 2012, what is now? 90% of uh, young people were working regularly from bed. This is, of course, at the same time that Bloomberg was promoting the little, the, the small uh, micro uh, apartments. So it is almost a, a return to, to the 20s, to the idea of a small apartment with many uh, other uh, uh, social spaces for eating, for uh, socializing, etc. I mean, we are living in, in fact in 19th century uh, cities with the separation of the office towers and everyone. In fact, millions of people are working in a different way. Shouldn't we acknowledge uh, 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 that reality? In terms of the micro apartment, what struck me is the reduction in the size and the fact that uh, actually many young people will acknowledge and I, that they work in bed. So it's not anymore the idea of a Murphy bed or a bed that comes out of a couch or something like this. No, no, it's an apartment that practically means you walk in and this, yeah, it's your bed and you do so many things, so many different uh, things in bed. So isn't that an architectural problem? So then we, if the bed is now um, a site of uh, so many uh, activities, if so many uh, people are using the, the bed for work, for communication, for uh, all these other things, so then we, uh, think about the, uh, the question of the bed as architects. It's in a sleep also mm -hmm. an architectural and urban uh, uh, mm -hmm. problem. So it's uh, kind of... Uh, That's very interesting. <coughs> yeah. Well, maybe we could tie it back to governance. So how, so cities need young people. The young people are the lifeblood of the city. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they, they bring the vibrancy and they're the workers in the tech industry and they're the, tend to be the artists. Mm -hmm. What, how can cities um, make it possible for young people to actually live and work and play and create right in the creative heart of the city? I think the most important thing is the price of the housing. This is the, the most Im important and base expenses they have. Once they can pay the house, they, the next maybe is 
some kinds of they live very with austerity. They don't need most of them. Are, there are different, but I think the most important is to recover the city for young people, not to be outside because gentrification and and tourists and so on. We have uh, uh, grown from seven million to three years ago of tourists, eight million, nine. Last year we had ten million tourists. Uh, it we can be like that. No, we have to recover the city for the citizens and for young people especially. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the young people in Madrid, they have a work, but they don't have a job. They have to create their own job every day, mm -hmm. which is a wonderful creativity, horrible for security of their lives. Mm -hmm. Do, do they need to do that effectively? Do they need to live in the city, or, or are they at a disadvantage if they're on the periphery? You know, they love to live in the city. As yeah. much crude and better uh, neighborhoods, because the life is there, and the the how they, uh, which is in my opinion one of the most interesting values of Madrid is to improvise. You can is a is a walkable city, and you can change your plans with someone in the mobile. Say, come, come, Luis. Okay, let's go. This is very interesting. You can do that when you have a car and you have to go 10 kilometers away. But you, you, when you walk, you can improvise. This is wonderful. You change of bed, maybe. Right. <laughs> right. So exactly what you were saying. Location uh, is, is more important than, uh, for, um, for many in this generation. Over, and, and the proximity is su super important. And besides, they don't like cars. They don't want cars. There is the first generation that will not own uh, cars, they have no interest in, in, in cars for Absolutely. the most part. Maybe we should see if the audience has any questions. How do we do this, Gabriel? Is there, are there microphones if anybody has a question? There's a microphone there. Right here. <laughs> oh, you were saying hi to a friend. <laughs> <laughs> you ask a question immediately. <laughs> Come on, Madrid is a quite is there. city. Yeah. So. There's a question there. Shout. He doesn't see. <laughs> Hi, I just want to ask, uh, due to your lecture, Luis, if we do just uh, what citizen what citizen just want can we create the monster of the reason I mean where are the visionary we need visionary people that can go ahead can go farther than a simple decision taken from a pool station so um, can we create the monster of the reason if we do just what citizen wants because I really think that successful plans like Bilbao, uh, if we, if the citizens could have the chance to vote, maybe they reject it. So, and it's just as successful. And it's, it's due to visionary politician that we need visionary politician. For example, in Madrid, Gran Vía, it seems there, there will not have a cycle path as people voted. Or for example, the, the, the square next to Barcelo Market is not what uh, citizens voted. They made a different, a different project. Or also Plaza de España, it seems that it won't be what people voted, the project that people voted. So where is the limit? Where is the balance? Where yeah. Are we creating the monster yeah. of the reason? Maybe yeah. I, I don't know. I, I need a, a yeah. to participate. Answer. To participate, to, to engage citizens is not to resign your responsibility. You have both. Both, of course, you are elected to do your job. You're paid for. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to make uh, 3.5 million mayors in Madrid because it's the jungle. But um, we are. We have learned that we can uh, let the people vote a proposal, a project that has not passed previously the filter of the technicians because it creates, it creates frustration because the most voted project was not uh, possible to be made. So we changed that 
and the next consultation we made in 12 squares in Madrid, there were two options which you prefer, but both are legal, both are able, we are, both are affordable. Um, I said in the beginning of my speech that I think we are in the 10% of the pro pro work in progress. We have to learn, and when, we, when I, we, I spoke about participatory budget, other cities, I was last week in, in Palermo, and uh, the colleague of Hamburgo told me the most organized groups uh, monopolize the activity of the city because you mobilize 500 people and you move the city. So it's not a real opinion, but it's the opinion voted. So that's why my final um, question was how to mix the world of demoscopia with the world of participation because there is a lack of credibility of this participation. That things you opposed. You, people voted some things that they were not done. Uh, well, I think we have to work harder to recreate the permanent will of test and error and mistakes and and redefine how to work that, because both we have to work. It's not only a politician or a technician, uh, top down, that say, this is what you want. I have interpreted the re di divine revelation. No, or 200 people say this is the city, and the rest they say nothing. Nor, nor new, new, no one thing, nor the other, no? But uh, I think we're, as I told you, uh, trying to, but we have to work hard to ameliorate that. I, I agree with you that is, is, uh, some things don't work very well still, but we're trying to solve that. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. The clock is saying we're out of time, so thank you all. <laughs> thank you. Okay, now we'll, we'll move on to the, the second section, uh, which we call transformations, if I could have my slides up here. So this is um, looking, looking at the, the interventions that can improve the city. And I'm, I'm going to, uh, and there's so many, I just picked a few that we're working on. And I think of it as uh, living large with less. And in fact, the, trans the transformations I'm going to focus on are transformable transformations. Uh, and uh, th this, and interestingly, Beatrice mentioned this, this is former Mayor Bloomberg standing in a 300 square foot apartment. At the time, he said that to remain economically competitive and culturally competitive, we had to solve the problem of affordable housing for young people. So this was a 300 square foot apartment with a pull-out sofa bed, a tiny kitchen, almost no storage, and uh, we didn't like it very much. <laughs> so we said, let's, let's make it a third smaller but three times bigger in terms of functionality. So we made a 200 square foot apartment that we, we did this in about a month at the Media Lab, put it together. And the idea was that easy is not good enough, you needed effortless transformation. So this cycled from a queen size bed rather than a pull out double bed to a, an office, to a dining space for six people, to a living space for six people. It had a very compact bathroom that you could use without moving the wall, but if you opened it up then you had access to a shower and a washer dryer. Uh, we had a lot of fun filming this, by the way. The kitchen counter could expand. And then the students had fun with using hand gestures and touch sensors and voice activation. And uh, in the end, they planned a party. And uh, remember, this is for millennials. The, the interesting thing for me is you have to think in four dimensions in that 
If you design this way, you have to think about transformations between spaces from any one to any other one. So you, had to, you have to bring in the dimension of time. And uh, wow, well, if you could see this video, <laughs> uh, what you would see is the, the, then what we did with a spin-off company. And, and by the way, we found off in, uh, so we spun off a version of this, we commercialized it, Three of the students who were my master's students then are now leading the company. And uh, we learned that the number one reason why people hated smaller apartments is there was no separation between living and, dine and, and sleeping when a couple lived there. So in this space, you have a big living room during the day and it divides into a smaller living room and a smaller bedroom. Oh, and if you could see, I forget what this one was. <laughs> All right, you can see this now. So we did, uh, we had fun, we, we did a quick hack. This was a little workshop, and the idea was that if we could do robotic furniture in a co-working environment where needs change all the time, then you could dynamically reconfigure that space. So here she sneezes and the Kleenex comes to her. <laughs> She's been sitting too long, she gets a sedentary alert, so the desk raises up and it takes her over to a treadmill <laughs> where she can get exercise. And now there's chill mode, so the beer comes out and all the tables go into party mode. And this was, this was kind of silly, but we're actually now looking at, uh, you know, actually bringing uh, robotic furniture into the workplace. This, if this video was playing, you would see this uh, wall. Okay, there it goes. You would see, this is a robotic partition with integrated lighting and it can do a little dance and it can be automated. So you could have this autonomously reconfigure the space during the day. We, we filmed this down in the, uh, the lobby of the Media Lab. This is the escape pod. So as in workplaces, as people no longer have offices, many people don't even have assigned desks, they have hot swat desks. He's in what we call the escape pod. He's disturbed by the, the person outside the glass, so he dials in the transparency. And then he also uses the same interface to dial up the desk. Now he's been, uh, because he's been sitting too long, so now he decides to take a nap and he dials down the nap. Now this is actually a laboratory where each one of these panels are removable so you can get to power and data and you can hack it. So we have, we have one, one panel there that's a lighting fixture but we're looking at health sensing and even using aroma, uh, all kinds of other things. So this is a, actually a living laboratory that we will be developing over the next few years. Mobility, this is the City car that we did a few years ago, we decided that uh, the real problem with cars was, uh, one of the main problems was parking. So we developed a little vehicle that could fold, so it occupies roughly a third of the space of a conventional vehicle when parked. So it had robot wheels, drive-by-wire, front egress, folding, three vehicles to a parallel parking space. We like to build things, so if this video was playing, what you would see is a full-scale prototype that we built and tested it in, north, in northern Spain. And right here, that's a yoke. It pivots left and right. Remember, it's all drive-by-wire, so when this front door opens, this yoke goes vertical and you step directly out. When we finished that, we decided that um, it was already obsolete. So we decided to do a little three-wheel vehicle that could be autonomous, that could come to you wherever you are. So here we are testing it in Taipei. We took, uh, we have a project with Taipei Tech to look at these kind of autonomous urban vehicles. The question we're asking is how can an ultra-lightweight autonomous vehicle that's di designed in the bike family be a good neighbor in the city? So here it's interacting in, a, in an unplanned, spontaneous way with pedestrians and bicyclists. This guy just decided to see what it would do by riding in front of it. <laughs> and somehow he intuitively knew it would stop, even though people have no direct experience with autonomous vehicles. Somehow we jumped all the way back. Okay, urban farming. So another, another transformation that we think are so important uh, is to produce 
food directly in the city. What you see here are aeroponics. See, these are roots, so they're in a misting chamber. So you continuously mist the roots with nutrients and water so you don't need to grow in soil. So growing in soil is uh, so last millennial. And now I think the future will be growing directly in water or even directly growing in air. And what we're uh, imagining is a future where just like farmers had direct contact with the food or um, a thousand years ago people people had a much more intimate connection to where food came from. I think we can begin to get back to that by growing food, in this case, directly in a restaurant where you can see and experience how food is produced. And the last thing I'll mention is uh, what we're thinking about in, with respect to um, modeling and simulation related to urban design. This is Barcelona. I love the, the, the whole the, the Barcelona party and the beautiful blocks and the spaces they created. So we took our optically tagged Lego bricks and uh, did a, a schematic design related to the Barcelona plan. And each of these elements can be mapped to different functions, different types of offices and housing. And in this case, millennials were in the micro units like we showed, mid-career professionals in yellow, senior executives in red. And the, and the goal here was to optimize that interaction. So here we're moving micro units from this inexpensive ghetto down into the center of the city and then visually seeing the interaction between these three types of people, the idea that if you have diverse people interacting in high density places that are well designed, that you increase the innovation potential. Thank you. Transformation. Okay, so the, the next Petra Kucha is uh, uh, Vinnie Maas. He is the co one of the co-founding directors of the Rotterdam-based architecture and urban planning firm MVRDV. He's a professor at TU Delft and director of the Y Factory. We heard from Vinny today. He does fantastic work, so welcome. Thanks. Thanks, Kent, to uh, introduce me and to be part of this uh, Pekka Kutje. Let's not uh, waste too much time, that's the concept. Um, I would like to um, talk about transformers, actually cities as transformers, because rapid growth of cities, as Kent has been explaining, that puts also a weight on the shoulders of them. Big global issues cannot be avoided and need to be covered by actually these players. And this puts them in the front line of action, I would say. And they can do that, and that's what the Y Factory tries to do due to their density, their economy, and uh, their democracy, they could do it. And they can or should be there for the motors of, oh my god, there's someone calling. <laughs> they should be the motors of global transformation. So what can they do as transformers, is what I would like to ask. And I would like to take you to a list of 14 possibilities. Yes, they can do. Cities can do what? They can make energy, is the first statement I would like to announce. Because they can make beautiful things that can float around in their parks or in the seas next to it or on top of their roofs that make energy making more sexy and that can contribute with this kind of products to a rapid, say, uh, uh, cleaning act on that, on that level. Cities can cool. They cannot be cool only. They can cool. And in a research that recently was undertaken by balloons, they can somehow make this kind of, say, clouds at the moment to, uh, uh, to, to, to turn that cities into areas where you don't need your air coal and reducing somehow in that way uh, this um, horrible aspect of energy con con uh, consumption. Cities can create biodiversity. They can create habitats. The research that's going on is to make say a series of say products where say rabbits can go around, where wolves can eat them in certain pl places. And by having any piece of our uh, productions, from the tiles in our houses, the tiles on the streets, to the tiles on the, on the walls or on the roofs, it can transform into new habitats. Yes, animals are clients, as you are. 
cities can feed. Well, and I think uh, Kent was also a little bit talking about that, and um, I'm also talking about Barcelona in that way, and uh, in a product where, um, say, this crop rotation devices can feed not only Catalonia, but all the Costa Iberica, which is one of the most vulnerable parts of, uh, of, of Europe in terms of food production and energy uh, uh, consumption as such. It would transform the roofs a little bit. You have the flattest roof of, um, of any city that, you, that is existing in, in the world, so why not turning Gaudi in that direction? Cities can produce water in uh, more than only, uh, say, consumption it, by, for instance, stacking this amount of, say, concrete elements, stone elements. You can harvest water in the very heart of it. You can keep it. You can, uh, and you can turn it as a kind of, say, not only cooling device, but also like a cleaning device, as this has been proven in certain of the products that have been developed recently here for the drier climates in the south. Cities can create oxygen also. And that is one element that we that can use for all our this is a research, the green dip that just started, in, that to see how much is this contributing to what, in that way, to, to this action in production. Can we cover it? What products do we need? And we need to go beyond the known elements, I mean, the, the towers in Milano that have been made to go one step further. They can uplift the poor. New economies should be somehow investigated in order to use our middle class and gradually to enlarge it and to, uh, to turn it into a kind of egalitarian system, like, say, this, the, how in Medellin, say, from this, we can turn it into somehow kind of Greek community uh, that attracts people, is this uh, project is about. It can create access. And um, in a series of projects at the moment, um, we try to make more, say, stairs on different buildings so that, I, um, uh, that, that we can climb up and create a second level in the city and use them not this kind of ringing on a, on a doorbell and then you wait for like a thick, uh, say, porter that doesn't like to bring you in. We have to make it more public, is what this kind of stairs start to advocate. I, it was born, by the way, in Plaza de Catalunya, uh, where we couldn't do it. We could now build it in Rotterdam and in Amsterdam. Thank you, Spain. They can be open in that way, uh, cities. And how to do that with our building mass? In, so students, in this case, are investigating how we can open up our towers to create places for people to go to. This is what first made in that way in here, in San Chinaro, with our tower that where we open it up, where still the stair is lacking. And I do hope that we can do something with the neighborhood to make that kind of, say, emptiness that is in San Chinaro to turn that into some kind of usage. It is open, but too open, one could say. So how to do that and activate it there? And then can do that for more of the buildings and connect them as such. They can invite buildings more and more. And I think after that work with the students, we could do that with this market hall in Rotterdam to use social housing and lower uh, mid, mid um, uh, level housing to turn that and basically into a new kind of space for Rotterdam. And yes, cities can allow freedom as such. Here, an example of a student's work with developers in Taipei to stack housing, houses that you like to make and to, and to put them on top of each other so to create a sort of a, its own, say, destination. And yes, how to make them democratic cities. They can be in the, because of the density. And then maybe when you have that diversity and you have to negotiate with your neighbors to find the best and, uh, op, uh, say, composition, then ego becomes we go at the moment, is what they say uh, tests are trying to do. And ultimately, they can adapt. And gradually, I we can imagine that m new materials, from, say from nano to ultimately bio, can uh, accommodate, say, the wishes of animals and the wishes of people on time, on demand, at the same moment Then we are going. And then, ultimately, I would end that then cities can create somehow love, yes. They, uh, they show that they can love. And just as a, as a reminder, a new building that we make in Lyon that somehow wants to advertise that um, uh, with the mayor over that, that Lyon loves uh, you in that way and welcomes uh, you. Cities can do it. I hope to so see you soon in this series of Transformers. Thank you very much. Okay.
Next is uh, Professor Belinda Tato. So she is professor at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, co-founder of the design and consulting company Ecosistema Urbano. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's such a pleasure to be here. I hope to get you as inspired as I, as, as I am getting. Um, well, the first um, thoughts was uh, I was in the section of transforming, and I think we, we are getting we're transforming a space all the time, and we're getting transformed also people. So these are the three categories we're always working on, transforming environment, transforming people, and transforming technology. So within the environment, we have done a number of projects. There are different scales, different scopes, different contexts, but we have worked with um, transforming play into energy, transforming waste into water, into clean water, transforming water into climatic comfort, transforming wind into energy, and transforming vacant into public space. Regarding people, again, we, as, as my colleague uh, Jose was introducing before, we have been working in different ways to engage communities, to engage city officials, to engage different kind of levels of uh, social engagement in, into our creative process. So we are always promoting collab collaborative thinking. Uh, we engage communities in different ways. We prototype solutions. We think the best we can do is to actually pro provide experiences and not talking, talking so much, but actually to do something in the public space so people can feel it, can, can use it, and can have ideas about it. And also we transform people through education because I always say the most sustainable we can do is, uh, is educating, educating those generations who will be taking the lead in, in a few years. And then transforming through technology. We, we love to work with the low tech versus high tech because we need to guarantee the maintenance is possible, is affordable and it's there. Uh, we like our uh, technology as a social tool. Again, how can we you know, connect people better in a more efficient way to, to, to live in their cities. We believe in openness and creative commons, and we love this idea of understanding a problem as an opportunity in not such a problem, it's a design issue. So this is a small project that we did in Dordrecht in the Netherlands. It was, uh, it was a deprived area, and we were invited to provide a solution for a playground. So we like, again, this idea of sustainability. So this is a um, carousel that actually, with the movement of the gears throughout the day, is producing and collecting and storing the energy for the lighting in the night. So we very much um, enjoyed the process and we very much learned from the uh, European code for designing playgrounds, which is kind of a nightmare. And then you, you, you finalize, uh, you, you find out that the kids are using the space in, in many rare and, and very scary ways anyway. So this is another project. This is in the outer skirts of Madrid. Uh, it was um, a competition that was calling for ideas for a kindergarten and it's a very suburban area as you can see. So it's very much about you have your own swimming pool, you don't have to talk to anybody. So we wanted to make sure that we were creating a social space. But on top of that, we wanted to create this kind of um, um, water recycling system. We do live in a, in a context where water is very important. So not only the building should be sustainable in terms of energy use, but also we wanted to guarantee that. And again, this was a very important feature for us to be placed in the public space. So we're, we're kind of sharing the message with the community. So it's not just a professional issue that we share today with all of you, but actually getting people you know, aware of it. So we work with this uh, macrophyte uh, lagoon system. So these plants are kind of floating in the water and they have the ability to clean not only the rainwater but also the black waters from the building. And we wanted to place and to make it happen in front of this kindergarten so the kids and everybody around knows about it. So because we have this microfine lagoon, we, re we have the possibility to actually create a garden or a, or a public or green space. So we ask, we're cleaning the water for the irrigation of the park. And it has become a very kind of popular and social space in such a kind of industrial context, which is very shocking. And it has become a kind of a landmark for the community. This is another project, as uh, Jose was mentioning, this is in the north of Oslo, it's in Hamar. So this uh, used to be what they call a, a square, it's the main square in the city, but actually it was very much a kind of a two parking lots and, and with a highway in front of it. So we invited um, an art collective from Madrid and the idea was like, let us try, let us test ideas, let us prototype, let us make it happen so that people can actually not argue anymore about being a parking or not, but actually test and experience the space in a different way. So we created this action which was called Paint Hammer. And then we did this, which was Cream Hammer. It was about an open coffee and free for, for all. 
And then we had the cream hammer. We invited them. Um, uh, this was a workshop with the students from the Bergen Architecture School. And they, they as it was, it is very much a farming area. They said, you know, there has to be a cow because it's a very, it's very linked to the identity of the community. We did the green hammer and all that. So little by little, it was kind of very much embedded into the community. So it was, it was a design that people were being aware, intrigued, of course, upset sometimes. But, uh, but it was, it was interesting to see how they shifted from a very negative attitude towards removing the parking towards a more kind of proactive um, um, approach. So it, was, it also became a very, um, uh, an exercise done by more than 1,400 kids in the community. So they were brainstorming themselves. And it was interesting to see that for most of them, the water feature was very important, although they have a huge lake just by the, by, by the square. So finally, the design was incorporating this water feature, which is very much a, a water element in the summer, but also a skating rink in the winter. And this is another project. This is about changing um, water into, into climatic comfort. So this is a, a project that we, we will have the opportunity to visit tomorrow. So it's, um, the air in Madrid is very dry and, and the temperatures are quite high in the summer. So the whole idea was to lower down the temperature by misting water into it. So we have this system that actually allows the wind into these cooling towers. So the air gets fresher, heavier, and it creates a microclimate at the ground level. So this is the original picture of how the street was. As you can see, it's not very inviting in terms of climatic comfort, social interface, public space, or whatever. So these are the original trees. And there was parking lanes, driving lanes, and parking lanes, and then the same scheme on the other side. And again, you know, by creating this um, small or, or simple feature, you are creating public space. And this was open in 2000 five, the first um, phase, and then in 2007. And it was uh, monitored by uh, one of the scientific research uh, teams here in, the, in, in Spain. So it was interesting to really measure, to be able to measure how this is really conditioning and changing the, not only the space in terms of social relation, but also in terms of climatic comfort. This is a, a different version that we were invited to do for, for the Shanghai Expo. The Shanghai Expo was very shocking because the motto was better cities, better lives, but still the master plan for the, for the Expo was extremely uncomfortable in terms of human weight for the, for the huge queues. So we were producing this element that was also connected to real-time censoring. So the whole idea was, again, to provide this climatic comfort, which was completely different because the, the condition in Shanghai is about a lot of you know, very high humidity but also uh, a lot of heat. So we had these three different layers, which was a projecting layer, a darkening layer, and a solar screen. And this became a kind of a lantern and had different kind of uh, configurations throughout the day and the night. And one video- Can we dream about urban atmospheres that connect us to nature? Can we imagine merging aquatic activities in urban life? Can we combine natural elements and technologies to provide climatic comfort year-round? Can we create a flexible building that promotes entrepreneurship, citizen engagement, and digital interaction? OpenShore creates the framework to experience an urban wetland landscape. Enjoy the city while swimming. Discover a rainbow on a sunny day. Connect with others and get inspired. but this is a Pecha Gucha. I was given six minutes, I'm up. And so this is a competition we won last year in West Palm Beach in Florida and we're working on it. So thank you very much. Yep. So next up, uh, Anapuma Kundu. I love that name. <laughs> so... Uh, I can also say just Anu. Anu, that's easier. She's visiting professor at uh, the University of Stuttgart and founder of Anu Architects. Is that how you say it? <laughs> Sorry? Anu Architects? No, whatever. No. Okay. <laughs> What's in the name? Um, and been central in the development of the city plan of uh, Aroville, India. Thank you. Thank you, Norman, for enabling this uh, opportunity for exchange. 
and uh, of ideas over cities and for every and, and to everyone be working behind the scene and to all of you for being here and listening i i would like to share my concern and that's not the first slide okay my the title that i um, would like to give this presentation is rethinking materiality in the age of urbanization i would like to uh, stress the fact that um, current ways of building the materiality and technologies themselves are perhaps the problem and creating social segregation affordability issues so current ways of building are neither affordable in money terms nor in environmental terms and the rate at which um, um, problems are growing um, they cannot be solved by the technologies that we are using these days i refer to the fact that when um, europe and america were was urbanizing and when industrialization enabled standardization to such an extent that uh, small uh, brick quarries got uh, replaced by much larger industries and everything that was within a human scale got out of the human scale and got into the machine scale and they that led to a kind of uh, building style that the western world managed to achieve because they managed to lay the infrastructure they developed slowly however in all the countries that are urbanizing now um, uh, and india where i have mostly worked is part of that we are one sixth of the world's population not yet urbanized properly we are faced with a huge uh, and oh, we are overwhelmed by population explosion as well as rural urban migration beyond that there are globalization related factors that are leading to cities that typically look like this the, there's an urban form in almost every city whether it is south america africa um india we have these kind of three skylines you have um outside the small city proper there are highways that have linked those cities and you have a middle skyline of buildings coming up without regulation because they were outside of the municipal area then you have corporate companies through global firms uh, resulting in that kind of a, a kind of a typical building typology that could be in singapore dubai um frankfurt whatever creating a high energy demand in a place that has not the infrastructure to provide it and and neither the workforce so simultaneously while that is being created you have the slums that are being actually proactively created as well but, but the the dangerous thing is neither of the three skylines work because all of them live they are like establishing three separate cities for different classes of people so um if one takes a step back and looks at how building material manufacture and building technologies took place in those places you know these countries have not yet industrialized so if we introduce those technologies in places that are not yet have not undergone industrialization what we actually have on the ground are local manufacturers of any building material any technology where you see that the building technology is closely connected the manif material manufacture is still mostly manual and the skills that have been achieved or the kind of fuel that is used to produce bricks are in fact all from the local area and very closely interconnected to the cycle of the uh, the rainfall pattern when the plantation is taking place when uh, uh, agricultural communities are free to the harvest thinnings from forests that they planted and so on so a brick is not just a brick the industrial brick is a different brick in terms of its impact than say the handmade brick so a lot of the work that i started doing since i graduated from bombay uh, about 28 years ago and immediately started my practice i tried to produce contemporary architecture i think the need of the hour is to produce um technologies that are closely linked to the place in terms of existing skills and knowledge but uh, vernacular systems don't work because we have to increase densities and we have totally different challenges so we we have to rethink everything but we cannot uh, afford to repeat some of the 
habits that we have created in other places. So I started uh, diverting um, skills of, uh, say, potters' communities and so on, who couldn't, um, they were losing their livelihood to urbanization. And I tried to um, divert um, their skills into urban um, needs. So they could start producing roofing systems and so on. I would summarize that most of these technologies that I've tried to promote are on one hand uh, not only uh, carefully looking at which materials to be, uh, are to be used um, or the ones that are um, with high embodied energy to be judiciously used in only some places where you need it, but also on the other hand trying to redesign the technology, negotiating between high tech and low tech, how much machine made, how much man made, in order to be able to employ local labor. It has, the local materials and local skills have to be critically examined. Sometimes new skills have to be introduced, but capacities exist. Sometimes materials exist, but they have not been used in that way and so on. So I've been working with reducing not just 20%, uh, not just uh, a little bit, you know, to, to get a green architecture like the European rating system uh, calls something uh, green. Because that standard is not, uh, it's way uh, out of the consumption capacity of the, uh, of the people in the rest of the world who need to urbanize. So what I'm tra targeting is to produce with significantly less. So I'm resorting to engineering above anything else to be able to produce light architecture that is high speed, but at the same time significantly reducing materials, using local materials, but creating um, knowledge and also community in the place. Some of the work that I've done is quite experimental and I think we need to create space for experiment in one to one if you want to drastically rethink. These are, for instance, houses that are mud houses baked in situ where cement is also not required. Uh, fire is the cement. Because usually when bricks are produced in kilns, typically about 40% of the heat is lost into the kiln balls again and again. So this is a way of tapping uh, that heat and producing a brick house for the cost of a mud house. And something that people can be involved in themselves. You know, affordability of housing we know now is no longer a problem of the developing countries. Every country in the world is devoting much more percentage of the per capita salary into housing. And because of the way we have raised standards and of building technologies and working with large companies and lots of overheads. So in every project like this urban eco-community prototype, we have often had to redesign technologies only to be able to allow participation of the people. So urban waste is another material we're using, but on the other hand, for places like uh, you know, refugees and for disaster relief and so on, where we need to put up housing rapidly, we are working a lot with ferrocement, which uses, like you can see, very thin meshes, very efficiently through engineering, to produce shelter in three or four days. And this is uh, part of that series that was uh, exhibited at the Venice Biennale um, of, of a Lego type system of uh, ferro cement housing that is going to become all the more relevant in the um, age of climate change with all the disasters that are going to come up. So I would like to end uh, by saying that um, apart from all the cities that are coming up, in uh, all, all the retrofitting that has to be done in all the cities that we have done in a, in a wrong way. There are cities that need to be created like Oroville in India 50 uh, years ago. Um, we, it was started on a clean slate and it's now a um, reforested place where people from all over the world are experimenting uh, with uh, how to produce high rise typologies within the human scale in a holistic way with integral thinking. Yeah, I would, I would leave this as the last image um, to say that the time has come to invest in knowledge, human resources. If we would invest in more time, more brain, more muscle, then we could uh, become clever on one hand. On the other hand, we could uh, seriously save a lot of natural resources. We need to not cut on the time required to think. Thank you.
Okay, our, our last speaker is, is uh, Tim Stoner. Tim is Managing Director of Space Syntax, a company based at the Bartlett School of Architecture, University College in London, and he is Director of the Academy of Urbanism and Deputy Chair of the United Kingdom Design Council. Thank you, Kent, and good evening, everyone. This is pretty intense, isn't it? Sitting there, wow. Um, thank you, Norman, for the invitation to be part of this. And uh, what I'd like to do to begin is to, is to pose a question. Why is it so often in cities that the most vibrant places seem to have been created by local people, not by professionals? And how can we as professionals learn from this? This street in, it happens to be Jeddah in Saudi Arabia, is, I think, the manifestation of the autonomous, innovative community that is at the heart of the workshops this week. And I believe we need to learn more about it, how it works, in order to design cities that are more resilient. Because the best efforts of professionals have often failed to create community. And this, in my view, is because architects and planners have often applied the wrong principles, focusing too much on cars, building at too low a density, separating land uses, the bed from the office, into different zones, and putting in too much divisive green space. Architects thought we should live up in the air, in streets in the sky and they put fences up to stop us crossing the road. And this kind of thing may look like a horror, but or this looked like a horror from the 60s or the 70s, but it's still happening today. But it wasn't always the case. Throughout history, great cities were planned around great streets, combining vehicles with pedestrians, with, with everyone moving relatively slowly. And these basic conditions sustain business. They generate the flow. They create the urban buzz. Movement isn't everything, though. What really matters in cities is when we stop and interact, because human interactions create social and economic trade. And trade is the fundamental purpose of cities. Indeed, we can think of cities as enormous transaction machines that drive economies, but also inspire new ideas and propagate our culture. I even think cities are a form of computer created purposefully by the species to solve our social and economic problems. It's why we build cities. And key to their effective functioning are highly connected street networks. 40 years ago, 4-0, Bill Hillier at University College London created computer algorithms that measure connectedness. And we found we could use this tool to very quickly predict pedestrian flows and car flows and cycle flows. So working with Norman and his colleagues in Trafalgar Square, we applied these techniques, observing people, and then using a computer to predict how they would behave when we built the new central staircase. And we found this approach to be very persuasive, observing and predicting but also combining it with the innate creativity of architects and designers. And the more we study street networks, the more we understand their incredible power. Connected street layouts create higher property values. And if you know this, it means that you can present your designs as an architect, not only in terms of how they will look, but whether they will also deliver a return on the investment. If you know this, you can design the economics of the city to create the affordability where you need it by also making the money where you need it. Now, some of the people who best understand the connectedness of space are criminals. It's taken us 40 years to persuade many architects, but burglars who break into houses break more into houses in the cold, blue, segregated, disconnected streets than they do on the red streets. 
because that's where there are more people. What we've learned keeps you safe in cities is the presence of other people. We are our own natural resource. So I often wonder why some architects can get excited about designing a one kilometer tall building that will be home to thousands when they could also get excited about a one kilometer street that might be visited by millions. Surely both should appeal to our creative instincts. And so here is the problem in a diagram. Architects leave the design of streets to transport planners who then create fragmented cities on the left. And the architects might then go on holiday to a wonderful ancient and integrated city and wonder why their life can't be like that at home. We need to learn to design streets. But things are changing, and they're changing from the bottom up. In Beijing, every time I go, more people are on bikes. Businesses are then emerging next to those bikes to benefit from the passing trade of the people on their saddles. The autonomous, innovative community is stitching the city back together. Working with Norman in London, we may soon run out of space for cyclists at ground level. So we have a project called SkyCycle to create a deck that would generate 500 million new cycle journeys above the railway tracks into London. Rapidly expanding cities in China need great streets and great connected street networks to take the pressure off their historic cores and to create genuine local centers around their edges where new jobs and new populations and new cultures can be created. But having designed the network, we then need to add the next layer of urban design. In this master plan in Darwin, Australia, we're making all the streets shaded to keep people safe from the sun and from the rain, but also to create the biodiversity, to create the life, to create the delight. And we're running a model, a land value model in the background to persuade the investors that these designs, because of their connectedness, will generate the land values that will deliver those returns. We want the biodiversity, but we need to make it affordable. So this means measuring at every scale, whether it's the scale of a whole country or whether it's the scale of the inside of a building. The human brain is capable of telling the difference between these scales. We need computer programs that do likewise to help us as planners and designers get it right at every scale. And we're continuing to develop these. Our master plan proposals for the city of Astana uses an algorithm to automatically generate the street network. We can sit back in our recliner and watch the city grow in front of us. In summary, to avoid the mistakes of the 20th century that I started with, I believe we need to do two new things. First, we need to look really carefully at how people live in cities. We need to observe. We need to be anthropologists. And secondly, we need to harness the best of computing so that we can better predict how they will live in the cities that are in our imaginations. And if they're not going to live well, we change our designs. Doing one or the other is not enough. We need to do both. So combining the insights of social science with the power of computer science is what I would argue is the new responsibility of architecture. Thank you. OK, I'd, I'd like to ask all of you the same question and, and uh, just frame it this way. So as cities become more successful, market forces tend to push out of the cities poor people, young people, families, seniors. What can we do to increase equity? Well. Do you want us to Please. give us the full answer? I'd like to hear from all of you if you have thoughts on that. I mean, I think the answer is, is, is no, it's, multiple, it's, not, it's not a single answer. It's like there's so many ways to work towards that end. And I think, uh, of course, design plays an amazing role. And, you know, many in the room probably are designers, but it's not only design. And, uh, 
uh, the person from the, from the mayor's office was mentioning today about balancing. So it's, it's very obvious that cities are, in many cases, very unbalanced. So somehow I think there is a, uh, a need to create this value into the, most, the more kind of um, deprived areas or underserved communities or something, so you can kind of raise their, their, their possibilities. But, uh, but what, I, what I meant by wow is like, that is not a simple question, so I, don't, I hope you don't, you don't expect a simple answer, right? No, I expect <laughs> a complex answer. No, but, I, but I would say that, uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, from my humble experience, I've been working in many different cities, in, especially in Latin America, and it's very interesting because usually the, the most kind of uh, difficult areas uh, usually have also problems, not only of infrastructure, but also environmental problems and all that. So that's why I mean, there's like, there's so many ways to work to, you know, to balance those neighborhoods, so, mm. yeah. And is that a relevant question for, for India? Um, I think globally what I would say is that, uh, yeah, it's a relevant question. I think uh, we really need to think about this question. I would say on the policy level, cities need to um, uh, really rethink that housing is, is provided by the city and it should not be a marketable thing. That's where we actually went wrong. And I think cities should use their own uh, resources to d their own lands, their own money to advance and you know, there are in Copenhagen you have very good models of how one can rethink. Basically we have to get out of the debt financing uh, thing which we take it for granted that housing can only be provided by developers and whatever they say the cost of it is, we are supposed to raise that in, and whatever the bank says we should give interest, we, we are taking all this as given, all of this is not uh, given. One can immediately change all that, you know, so on the policy level. On the technology level, I would uh, think that if people could, uh, if they would be able to participate in the construction if they want to, they could significantly reduce the debts that they will have or how much, if they can give some time. And even in, in this I learned in Berlin, there was a Selbsthilfe project uh, when, the, when East Berlin was integrated. And it was very successful because people could, um, people have much more time than we think, even in cities, you know. Uh, people, this, 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 then these architects would have to design technologies that would allow people to build and pol uh, policies that would allow people to be free of the sharks. So you mentioned public policy, design, technology, all three have to come together. Tim, do you have a... Well, yeah, I, I had a different three, but I'll, I'll, I'll offer it. A place as an architect uh, is important, but it's not the only thing. But if we just look at place, I think cities need to be slower. Cities need to be more connected. Cities need to be denser. But alongside those design issues, there's the design of, uh, design of place. There's the design of finance. We've heard something about participatory budgeting. You know, we need more innovative means of financing. Um, strategic land infrastructure investment models, are, are, that's, an, that's a phrase that's going around in my head at the moment, so that we don't have to make all our money on the, when the deal is done. We can make our money over time. As anyone who, who has uh, the great estates of our cities have made their money over time, not overnight. And then lastly is the, is the design of, gov of governance itself uh, and how we actually make decisions. And we've heard about some of all of those this evening, but I think perhaps finance might be something to hear more about because that really just seems to make the difference. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you mentioned one of your points was lift up the poor. So it was your presentation that actually triggered this question. Well, let me answer this to your question in three levels. So one is the, um, in general, I think we want to have a globe where everybody is part of the middle class. Okay? That seems, um, and then I'm interested in how we, with our macroeconomies, we could somehow steer towards that. And uh, is it going fast or is it going slow? Let's judge that. And I'm happy with new middle class, with all this stupidities in, in, uh, in China. I'm happy with the middle class in, in India, where somehow it helps to kill the caste system in that way, so um, with my limited knowledge on that. So that's one uh, level. Second element is because you come from, from, you come from a specific background. Yeah? You, so the word gentrification in your culture 
is different than the word gentrification, say, in China or in, uh, also in parts of Europe, and where in, in those places gentrification is welcomed to get more economy and to get a better, say, like middle class at that moment. In many of, maybe due to your history in the, U, in the, in the US, it's like a, like a curse or like a, a political incorrect um, uh, momentum. So that's, that, uh, that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. So that's why. Um, so my third reaction is on, on the level of policy. Uh, the, these, things, these things have maybe nothing to do with each other, but somehow we maneuver to that. So the, um, this week I was fascinated, no, it was a couple of weeks ago, was um, in a discussion in France about how good is it going with uh, social housing. I think social housing, I completely agree with you, is a very important instrument. And uh, it's a treasure for our culture to, uh, to have it. So the Dutch did it pretty well, in a way. The Danes do it, do it pretty well. Uh, in that way, uh, uh, claiming always 30% of uh, housing um, and, uh, and, and making that everywhere um, and, and, and keeping that also as a kind of treasure box uh, in our tax system. Basically, you have property, a collective tr property, that even on the most expensive areas, you have property. As a, uh, which I find fascinating as a tool. So the French uh, decided also to do it in Greater Paris. Yeah, they tried to, to make it in, um, it took them half a year to install the laws, 40%. 40, 40%. They were a bit, yeah, I love it even more. So the big talk, of course, in the MIPIM in the, uh, was like, because they have to apply it now on every project. That I find humorous. So you built on Champs-Élysées 16 houses. So 30% has to be social housing. And complaints, of course, in the developers. About how can we do that? Maybe we can. So they t start to, to a process of like a negotiating position, like, uh, like we do with, with energy also. If I have a forest in, in, in uh, Poland, I can compensate my insane flight pattern in that way. So it's, 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 it's stupid, but that's how it somehow still is doing. And that I find fascinating now, the discussion in uh, how to apply that. I would plead that for social housing, which has a, is an enormous tool of, uh, of your egalitarian uh, uh, desire, that we do it in this kind of, say, North European manner, and that we are insistent collectively of doing that, and that we pay for that, yes. That I think is, you know, maybe I'm too social democratic in that way, and too, but it's the only way to do. We cannot leave that to the market. We cannot leave that to this. Um, it's a collective enterprise, and it has the values. And I hope that you can calculate so, the cost and benefits. Thoughts. Yeah, thanks. Well, um, I just wanted to add one, one thing to the discussion, which is to be more equitable. I think cities as a whole and cities in their streets should not close their doors to strangers, should not close their doors to immigrants, should not close their doors to new people. Mm -hmm. When we've studied great streets and great public spaces, uh, we've often found that the majority of activity passing along the street didn't originate there, wasn't destined for there, it was just passing through. Mm -hmm. That is the movement that keeps you safe when we look at the crime pattern. When we look at people sitting in public spaces, they haven't come from the buildings that line the public space mm -hmm. alone. In fact, the majority very often comes from somewhere else and somewhere at distance. People import and export all the time. Mm -hmm. They come to cities from the, the, the land in China or they come to cities from other countries. Yeah, other but Tim, what does, the, what, does, what does your remark add to uh, his observation on getting a kind of more equalized... Uh, because uh, the more pattern? you parcel the city and you remove this through movement that introduces new cultures to existing people, right. That's you lose it. the inspiration, the innovation that helps you think about what cities should so be. Equity, diversity. You lose opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. It's a tool. And it goes back to Jane Jacobs and eyes on the street with, with respect to security and safety. But it, it, it's actually, it's more than that. It's, it, that's, it keeps you safe, but it also keeps you smart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, and it increases the innovation potential, I think, the, the data shows. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about technology just for a minute before we run out of time. So, Tim, you, you talked... Um, you showed some, some beautiful work about um, look at, looking at the street connections and also running property value models. Looking to the future, um, what, what is top of your list, wish list of things 
to simulate and predict that we're not currently capable of doing? Um, well, actually, top of the wish list is to disseminate this. There's, there's, most of this stuff's open. And at the heart of our mission as a business is to get it out into practice and have it used. So we've opened the source code to allow others to do that. We don't want to have a monopoly on this. It's, it's too important. So we've pushed it out. Right. Um, what do we want to be able to do next? Is, is act and practice. You know, we can keep... I get very concerned in the world of smart cities that there's a lot of data porn, if I could use that expression. There's a lot of very glamorous stuff being done with data, titivating. But what really works? Is it really based on human life? Is it really going to add something to uh, a project? Or is it just going to entertain an audience? Well, that was what I was hoping you'd get to, because right now we can simulate low-level things, like energy or street connections. But we can't really simulate, predict quality of life, social interactions, things like equity, with all the different inputs, economic, design, technology, um, et cetera. That's where, that's where I'd like to see it go. Mm -hmm. Do you all have, what, what would you all like to be able to predict in your practice? Well, happiness. I mean, happiness, see, yeah, exactly. I, mean, I, I would love to be designing the best environments for people to be happy at every possible scale. So yeah, I don't know if we can measure that. Probably it's very cultural, very contextual, very personal, I don't know. I don't know, but that's, that could be a parameter to measure. That's beautiful. <laughs> uh, I mean, I would like to hope that while we are busy measuring whatever we can measure and keep on optimizing whatever we can, there are a whole lot of important things that we actually can't measure, but we know, we all know, and beauty, mm -hmm. harmony, peace, all the things, basics, we, we can't measure, so we, often they get left out nowadays. Yeah. It's very worrying. I'm afraid that the debate uh, today about transformations is, is getting very dispersed. Uh, and um, so, <laughs> as a choreographer of this debate, I think it would be, I, mean, I find it interesting how, so I love the word transformation, but we can be more active in what we now are discussing. Yeah. So that is, and, and with all the um, observation systems, for instance, that you do in, uh, in MIT, yes, here we, we want, how can you, activate with all those knowledge the world a bit more intensive. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think... Transform, it, it, huh? Exactly. I do, th I do think that um, enabling equity is, a, is an important transformation. Yeah. So I think we, we should um, see if there are any questions in the audience. Anybody? There. I didn't realize there were people back here. <laughs> we are here. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for all of you. Uh, my, um, I, I don't have a question. I, I have um, a thought. <laughs> and I would like to thank you, these two women, uh, Belinda and Anapurma, because I think that cities need women like you. <laughs> Because for me, the most important thing in transformation is, like you have said, happiness and connection and, I don't know, give people a identity and give people the power to feel that they are uh, in, in their cities with, with, I don't know, with, with capacity to transform them. And, and I think that today, for me, it's a revelation that maybe it's only women that can be can have this capacity or, or this uh, sensitiveness. I don't know. I, I don't have the words in English, but this um, capacity of understanding the necessities of people, and this is a reivindication of women today for me. <laughs> Do you have a response? Listen to, listen to the audience. I think hmm? it's better to have more questions, I guess. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, 
Thank you very much for the talk. Um, I found really challenging to, because I really like the idea of Miss Mrs. Kundo of. Uh, hello. Okay. Um, I really like uh, your idea of um, the way of using materials to build, uh, to use construction and building as a um, local thing. And I also really like the idea of Mr. Stoner of uh, data analysis and using data to understand how cities have to grow, how, how things can be more efficient. And I feel that these two conceptions can be really easily contradicting each other. I feel that uh, data analysis, especially the way it may be interpreted, can give us a very efficient way to build something or to, for a city to grow which will very easily contradict things that are local, things that are, um, things that are related to uh, the culture or the background that is necessary to maintain uh, the essence of a place. So I would, my question would be, um, and I think this relates to equity as well, how can we balance this two things. How can we balance local, uh, environmental, um, background, cultural uh, elements, which are, tend to be more specific and subjective, to the new elements that the world is bringing us, which are data analysis, uh, computer science, um, and all this Google data, like the Uber, Uber self-driving cars that suddenly, like in 20 years, no one will drive a car. How can we balance these two things to, referring to the question of Mr. Larson, to get a more equity city, a more equal society, especially relating to cities in this case, I guess, and to uh, architecture? Thank you. I would, I would say that uh, knowledge is global, and expression and, uh, of, of this, this knowledge is local, according to the appropriateness. And I, I, I think it's very important to recognize, despite all our differences, we are the same human species, and all the knowledge that is uh, there in any place is built upon all the other knowledge that was created. Everything is connected. So I don't see there's there uh, to be. I don't think there's any conflict. I mean, the places that I've shown, which is a huge area of the world, they don't even have electricity. So you can't directly go there with your computer. Like I lived for ten years in that place with my own solar panels and so on, I, because I needed to have my computer. So I think everybody can um, decide. And I think that the thing is not to choose one or the other. The thing is to integrate everything and see, just because we can um, outsource some of it to, to computerized uh, systems, if we, we cannot afford to not know the first principles ourselves. That's the problem. Otherwise, you have smart cities. and. This is not, you don't have smart citizens. You, you want to, if human technology, if technologies are advancing that rapidly, you cannot afford to let the human not evolve more rapidly. Great. Thank you. Well, I think we've run out of time, so th thank you all for. Norman, do you have a few minutes? <laughs> I think we have uh, over. Ooh, should we just? Oh, really? Well, we should have a book. So maybe, maybe I'll just ask you because we're, we've, we've run long. So, uh, I, but I, I, I do want to ask Norman a, a question that's important to me. What motivated the, the founding of your foundation? Um, several factors. One was the concept of an archive, a gathering place, an educational program with workshops to address the kind of issues that we've been talking about this evening. Um, and a project division uh, that would be able to act and to tackle issues which for whatever reason 
architects don't think of as architecture. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if you take 14% of humanity at the moment, which is one billion people on the planet, they can't throw a switch to get electricity, for heating, for cooking, for lighting. They don't have sanitation as we know it, and they don't have access to clean water. And nobody is really addressing those issues. The, um, the resort of politicians and planners is to bulldoze those settlements and to relocate the residents yeah. who ironically, by their presence, have raised the land values of the land that they've occupied. Their livelihood is dependent on their more affluent neighbors that they serve. Um, the level the standard of living compared with, say, the rural areas which they migrated from are higher. They're thriving communities in many ways. Um, if they're relocated and there's no infrastructure, as often is the case, um, then they have no alternative but to come back to the city to earn a livelihood. Um, so the idea that those settlements can be renewed from within, uh, that you could transform them. And through a combination of circumstances in the last year, uh, the workshops, uh, particularly the Digital X one that you and Nicholas Negroponte, um, we got very, very uh, carried away with the, with the potential for autonomy, the idea that um, for example, in Switzerland, there's a solar prize in my name. Um, and we've seen a progression over more than a decade from retrofitting houses to buildings which not only uh, provide their own energy, but, will, but the latest winner develops five times the amount of energy that it needs. Now, if you fed that back in terms of processing human waste, for example, recycling, then um, the, the, the clue through the workshops was ownership. And I shared this idea with, um, interestingly, an Indian entrepreneur, Ratan Tata, uh, who, uh, and, and I asked him, you know, tell me, do you think these, these ideas, are they insane? Mm -hmm. And he said, no, I think, they, uh, I think they're very sensible. And if you applied those ideas to the rural areas, you would also balance and stem the flow into the cities. But he said the problem is um, that, first of all, you'd have to find a slum that was small enough and manageable enough. And you'd have to find an environment of politicians, civic leaders, mm -hmm. who weren't corrupt and, and who bought in to the idea. Interestingly, through those conversations, um, exchanges have taken place and, um, and recently had a phone call from Rattentata who said, you remember the conversations three years ago, are you still interested? And I said, the foundation is exactly the kind of issue that it's working on. So he said, well, fantastic, because in Odisha, a province of, of, of India about the size of, of, of Spain, um, the, 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 the uh, chief minister, who's the equivalent of a prime minister uh, on a region like that, um, is, is having a ceremony to bestow land ownership certificates, and that's in three weeks' time. And this was, uh, this was last month. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing there is that um, that, that process has, has started. And, um, and I was with colleagues from the foundation um, visiting one of these, these slums in the morning before the event where there was an audience of 5,000 people and where with the chief minister and uh, Ratan Tata, we handed out land certificates to the first group of, um, of the slum dwellers, which is the first step to enable them to be able to... And, and it's interesting here, in that slum that we visited, for example, uh, you can have families who are fishermen 
and their families have been occupying that same plot of land for, say, 200 years, and they could still be thrown off. And there was a very moving ceremony where they enacted exactly that kind of eviction. Because they, they um, didn't own the land. Yes, yeah. so, um, and, and visiting this, this slum uh, was perhaps one of the most moving experiences of my life. Yeah. They had, first of all, the drone technology made possible the mapping and the surveying to enable this ownership process mm -hmm. to really take place. So you can imagine a two meter square table with a photograph, aerial photograph of the, of, of the slum. And next to it, in English, is something that says vision map. And it is the most beautiful two meter square in the traditional colors. And as they explained this, they said, for example, we would like a cyclone shelter. Because if we have a cyclone shelter, then we won't have to be evacuated away from this community. Um, their other vision map was something that doesn't exist. It was a playground. There's no public space there. Um, uh, obviously, uh, the areas that became free were the two areas that were the open latrine areas, one for male and one for female, because the sanitation would come into the individual houses. I mean, I could go on. One of the most amazing things for me was that they had also charted out an area of landscaping, and they explained the landscaping was to modify the gale force winds, which would not be a cyclone, but would again create a, a more benign atmosphere. They also wanted a space for a temple. And I realized through this process, at one, at one point I said, who's done this? This is amazing. And five or six women who were next to the table all raised their hands. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, <laughs> and they were, they were, it's your point. They were the community leaders. They were the architects. And I said, you know, you have a great future in a school of architects. <laughs> and um, so it was, it, it was, and I also realized the birth of, you, you, you may perhaps in, in, in Eastern cultures be aware, in China it's feng shui, but it has the equivalent in, in many different cultures. And I realized the birth of, of the, this, it's, 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 it's kind of a mythical sort of thing, but its roots was obviously, I mean, these people had lived with nature and they knew where the hostile forces were. Interestingly also, the, their main roots on their vision map replicated the roots that, that were on the photographic survey. Mm -hmm. And of course you realize that you can use the technology that we have. Right now, there are millions of people in a very comfortable environment, flying in the sky, on railways, in ocean liners. They're not connected to the infrastructure of heavy pipes and sewers uh, below the ground. Mm -hmm. So the space technology, which has already infused our lives and completely changed, I mean, whether it's the you know, uh, the little gizmos that we, that we hold in our hands. So, um, so I see, uh, you know, very, very optimistic uh, signs in it's that fantastic. sense. Fantastic. Well, this concept... Uh, so just to, so that, that is just one example of, yeah. of, of, of why I think yeah. the foundation is important. And it's fantastic that you, as one of the most successful architects, practices, build in the great cities of the world are interested in the informal settlements. Mm -hmm. And this concept of autonomy to me is, is very interesting because you can look at it different ways. So on the one hand, we can have the, the autonomous production of energy and purification of water and um, processing of sewage all in the community. Also, though, the, we, could, we can think of autonomy in terms of functional autonomy, bringing jobs into the community because many of these informal settlements, people leave every day and they go elsewhere, and that puts a lot of stress on the system, so. Well, I think you have to think holistically, so the potential for 
uh, some of the more advanced techniques of, of farming, mm -hmm. um, if those were combined with some of the initiatives that we're talking about. So, yeah. um, so obviously, there, there are a number of themes that weave through the conversations this evening. Um, and it's fascinating, this disparity between the kind of static um, economy of which we're a part Mm -hmm. and the booming, emerging economies, mm -hmm. high growth, yeah. explosive nature. Meanwhile, we are talking about bicycles and we're ripping up roads, the Boston Big Dig, and the statistical evidence that taking those roads away has reduced crime rates, has increased the, yeah. uh, the standard of living. Meanwhile, many of those economies are investing in something that that is already obsolete. Um, well, let's talk about that for a minute because cars completely transformed cities in a very short period of time at the beginning of the 19th century. And the, the car era is ending almost as rapidly as it came upon us. And I think it will transform cities again. How do you think that will play out? I think there's a cyclical thing. I mean, at the end of the, um, <clears throat> the 19th century, uh, the, the horse-drawn vehicle had brought, virtually brought the two biggest cities in the world at that time, London and New York, to a stop because they were completely clogged up with horse manure. Mm -hmm. um, so disease was rampant, the stench was, uh, was unbearable, and within a decade they were clean and, and the traffic flowed. The, the, the automobile was the, was the savior, was the good guy. The automobile has become the bad guy in terms of, of cities, particularly historic cities. And so we're seeing, you know, we're seeing that, that revolution. Um, and, um, and I think that you know, once, you, once you, 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 you go away from fossil, once you move away from carbon, you don't get the byproducts of that process. So you don't get artificial fertilizer. And if you don't get artificial fertilizer and water is short, mm -hmm. why is the countryside the place for agriculture? Because it's far from the cities that it's mm -hmm. feeding. And if you look at the, 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 the new technologies, um, you, you made, and I think it might be a closing thing because I'm yep. concerned about yeah. people's timetable. I could talk <laughs> forever. I don't have a problem. <laughs> Um, get a but but, but, the but, group but, but in, an, in an earlier conversation, Kent um, uh, said, imagine a parking space in a garage, and it's got a low ceiling, um, and there are no cars as we know it anymore, because uh, car sharing has gone up, um, uh, ownership has gone down, the vehicle's clean, um, and 65% of the city as we know it, which is devoted to, to the, the car, which for 96% of the time is sitting still, is designed to go you know, 100 miles an hour, carry five people, invariably it's only one. Tell me statistically what that one parking space could deliver yeah. using advanced agriculture yeah, you, as we know it now. If you use now. the kind of system I was sh showing here, the aeroponics, you could produce enough calories for five to six people in the space of one car. It's extraordinary. So what, what is the highest and best use of that land? To store <laughs> yeah. a car for 23 hours a day or to produce food for, for it's an interesting. It's an interesting option, anyway. I want, I want you to just ask, answer one more question, speaking of cars. So cars, when they... I'm a car freak, by the way, but that's okay. Well, I know. <laughs> When cars came into the city, we changed the land use regulations. We, we went from continuous street fronts and density to low density, separated buildings, parking lots, wide streets. Uh, do you think it's time to rethink those regulations? The regulations have been designed for the car. They've not been designed for the people who use the car and who live. So all the codes give you mandatory setbacks from the road so you can park the car in front of the house. And health and safety give you the distance between the two buildings. Mm -hmm. And so the wonderful 
organic, medieval, pretty, charming places that draw them as, as tourists, you cannot build them today because of the regulations. I mean, I've got a, um, a, a, just a side story on this. There's a village in Switzerland. Um, because of the way um, the farming patterns have changed, the youth are going away to the cities. And they want to do something to bring, to attract people to, the, they've identified a site. As it happened, around about that time, I'd visited some friends in a village which I'd seen for the second time, but I'd forgotten. And this village is a medieval village. It's clustered on a hill. Um, and the spaces are very tight. Uh, you can't drive a car through them. They're designed for people and, and horses going through. But with the technology of today, they're completely safe. Fire hydrants. And, you know, so, um, so I, knowing that those villages, knew that village up, up in the hills, um, I made a proposition to them. I said, that could be the inspiration for this new building. And the building is, a, is about attracting people, it's about using high technology companies, giving them an away place, a third place, where they could also interact with sport, with medicine, um, with, 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 with technology, um, as, a, as a gathering point. And, the, and we demonstrated to them in the early meetings that the, the village that they occupied, you couldn't do it with the codes. What if yeah. they, as a community, had the power to relax the codes? Would they do it? And they said yes. Oh. So it's, <laughs> it's early days, and it's an interesting start. But again, um, I think uh, on my closing note, um, one individual who was, was shown, Mike, Bloomberg, who uh, interestingly uh, generously funded this event and the workshop this week. And, uh, and Mike Bloomberg, with Carl Pope, ex Sierra Club, uh, produced a book called The Climate of Hope. And, um, and the big message is that climate change is the biggest threat that faces us as, a, as, as humanity, as a society. Um, it's too important to be left to politicians. They're too slow. Um, mayors, civic leaders, industrial leaders, everybody has to get together. They have the power to change. And I think that uh, also came through strongly yeah. this evening yeah. and was a very important thread uh, that ran through the whole thing. So, and on that note. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>